Uh, good morning. Welcome to Riggs Library in uh, Georgetown's uh, Healy Hall. Um, this is a very special occasion for us at both the Asian Studies Program and the Initiative for U.S.-China Dialogue. Uh, we have had the opportunity to bring three of the most eminent America's watchers uh, to this conference today. And uh, we had a great session yesterday uh, with them and many of the scholars on our campus. And then we thought we would give you the opportunity to listen to their views, listen to how they're looking at the U.S.-China relationship today. Just a word about where you are in this library. This is one of the few iron cast libraries left in America. It's considered one of the 10 most beautiful libraries in the world. Um, the Riggs family, just to show there is a China connection. Uh, Riggs, the original Riggs, Elisha Riggs, actually was a dry goods merchant in the early 1880s here in Washington. And guess what he imported from China? Tea and silk. And uh, we actually have his correspondence still in the library. You can see his correspondence with council generals in China, uh, with Chinese merchants. And so the world does not change as much as sometimes we think it does. So what I want to do is quickly just introduce the panel to you. Um, if I went through their entire biographies, mm -hmm. I'm afraid uh, we'd have no time for discussion this morning. They are truly eminent men, but let me just give you a thumbnail on each of them, and uh, then I will begin the session. So, Dr. Wang Ji Se. Not a doctor. All right, <laughs> Professor Wang Ji <Jisoo>. Se. <laughs> Uh, who is president of the Institute of International and Strategic Studies at Peking University. He's honorary president of the Chinese Association for American Studies, and he was a member of the Foreign Policy Advisory Committee of the Chinese Foreign Ministry from, from 2008 to 2016. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being careful here. Um, I've known him for many years. Uh, he was kind enough. We did a session in Rome recently um, at the Vatican on, uh, what was the title again of our discussion? Uh, eco uh, ecological uh, uh, civilization. civilization. Ecological civilization. Mm -hmm. So he and Tom Friedman of the New York Times did this wonderful session for the Jesuits in Rome, uh, and I really appreciate that, but uh, Gisa has just a tremendous understanding of the complexities of the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, really pleased to have him here. Uh, Dr. Wu Xingbo, Fudan University, head of their Americas Institute. Uh, again, I could go through a long list of his publications, um, but this is just to say that when the Chinese government wants to consult, as with Jisa, they turn to Xingbo and Xin Bo uh, gives just a tremendous insight into the relationship. Um, and so we're really happy to have him. And then from our own faculty here, Dr. Evan Medeiros, who we are so pleased agreed last year to join the university. He is the Penner Chair. There's another title in there, and I'm not going to remember it. What is it, Evan? <laughs> <laughs> Kling Family Senior Fellow with the U.S.-China Dialogue. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. De Dennis you is partner. You, you, you should think I didn't know that. Right. Anyway, uh, but uh, Evan really adds to our Asia Studies program, which is, uh, I think, growing by leaps and bounds in its reputation, in no small part to adding faculty like Evan. And then Shui Lan, uh, Dr. Shui Lan from Tsinghua University. Some of you may know he has just become the dean of the Schwartzman Scholars program in Beijing, a tremendous program started by Steve Schwartzman. If you have not seen their campus, their facility on the University of Tsinghua, uh, we have been lucky enough, I think three, three. three Georgetown students have been part already of the Schwartzman Scholarship program, but for you students, 
take a look at it. It is uh, becoming one of the premier programs in the world. I think uh, Steve Schwartzman liked to say it's the Rhodes Scholarship of China, right? Mm -hmm. Of the 21st century. Of the 21st <laughs> century, excuse me. <laughs> it's more than just of China, it's the 21st right. century. Mm -hmm. So um, we're really pleased to, to have Shui Lan with us. He is also a member of one of our workshops, uh, which if I can just put a pitch out for it, we have a business and economics workshop that we are running. We just put out a new publication from that uh, workshop group. And uh, one of the things we do at the US-China Initiative is we bring Chinese scholars and American scholars together, sort of create the seed money for them to begin to work together on different projects. We are always looking for new projects, so if somebody has something in mind, we'll, we'll take a look at it. Okay, enough of the introductions. So, as I was thinking about this morning, and what we were going to do, I kind of looked at two things that struck me. One was the other day on Fox News, I granted I doubt any of you watch Fox News, but I do occasionally go on and watch Fox News. Um, National Security Advisor Bolton said that China is the most consequential strategic issue of the 21st century. In addition, you'll all remember the National Security Strategy Report of the Trump administration. Let me just read you one of the lines out of it. China and Russia want to shape a world antithetical to US values and interests. China seeks to displace the United States in the Indo-Pacific region, expand the reaches of its state-driven economic model, and reorder the region in its favor. So let me start with you, Jisa, and ask, are we in a new Cold War? No. Uh, can you hear me uh, yeah, in the back? The, the microphone. OK. Is. Uh, I think I agree with you that uh, we are entering into a difficult stage of US-China relations. And the depiction given by uh, John Bolton on China uh, is what uh, he thinks and reflects a large number of Americans, including uh, the administration. And then people say, as you said yesterday, uh, it reflects the consensus between the Democrats and the Republicans on China. So as a watcher of US-China relations for the last 40 years, this is probably the most difficult time in the bilateral relationship. And uh, it did not start from uh, 19, uh, 16 when Trump was elected. It started much, I mean the downhill uh, uh, trend started as early as 19, uh, uh, 2008 or 2009 when Evan was, <laughs> was a respo re responsible right. Yeah, you see, up, up, until the time, <laughs> me. Up, up until the time I was in the White House in 2008, everything was going really right. well. And then when Evan came in, yeah. it just... It's the Obama hardliners. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I think it, you know, the, the, the deterioration of the bilateral relationship start much, started much mm -hmm. earlier. And then uh, the, the down downhill uh, pro process uh, was... was uh, uh, accumulated and then uh, uh, sped up uh, in the last two or three years. So this is, uh, we cannot reverse the trend. I, I don't, I'm not confident that we can reverse the, the trend of uh, uh, downhill or, or what you call uh, downward spiral in any short time. But if I remember history, not long, long ago, uh, in the after, it's immediately after 1911, uh, uh, September 11, then your country identified Islamic radicalism as the main threat. And it lasted quite, for quite a few years. And when uh, Obama came into office, uh, the, the, the spearhead was not so clear. Uh, and I remember that Obama had a doctrine of uh, don't stupid stuff. 
or don't stupid, don't do stupid stuff, or don't stu do stupid shit. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So he did not mm -hmm. emphasize any enemy country in the world. So this is something new. But my question is, how long will that last? Uh, it may last four years, five years, uh, until the second, uh, possible second term of Trump. And it could last even longer. Uh, until what time? Until China, until China disappeared from, from, from the world? Or until the United States is, is, you know, is in deep trouble? So I have several scenarios to put forward. But let me try first to make a distinction between China and the Soviet Union, between President China and the Soviet Union in the Cold War years. Uh, because some people say China is a Marxist country, a communist country, resembling that of the Soviet Union in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, I think in a way, of course, uh, China's similar. Uh, we call ourselves a socialist country when the Soviet Union was also a socialist country. But there are many, many very uh, large differences between the, the two countries. Uh, present China, present day China has, a, has an ideology. Marxism, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, three represents scientific outlook, mm. and then uh, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era. Mm. So this is a long list of ideologies, starting from Marxism. But I should remind you that China doesn't refer to Leninism as a leading ideology. That is very vastly from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union said with Marxist Lenin. And in my younger days, when in the modern years, we talk, talk about Marxism, Leninism, modern thought. So I asked one of my friends in, you know, who, studied, uh, who studies party history, he said Leninism was uh, deleted from uh, the leading ideology in the late 1980s or early 1990s for some reason. Because Leninism referred to you know, that kind of revolutionary zeal uh, against capitalism or, or imperialism. But yesterday, somebody uh, at the conference reminded us that Leninism has its domestic component, that is uh, class struggle and so on. So both Leninism's internal ex external implications are still somewhat relevant, but it, it is not leading China. Leninism doesn't lead China today. And uh, so that is vastly different. And China's ideology, uh, to put it very bluntly, is very defensive. That means that you know, we are peculiar. We are China. We are Chinese. We believe in Marxism, but we, we are not going to call for revolutions elsewhere. And some people say, well, you are you know, Chinese supporting uh, those countries that are anti-West, anti-American. I say, of course, uh, a lot of countries are like that. We support uh, Venezuela. We supported uh, uh, Zimbabwe, where I went to a few years ago. We supported uh, Cuba. Uh, and uh, we, we, we have a normal relationship with uh, North Korea. But China also supports countries that are friendly to the United States, like Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel. So this is not very this is not ideological. That means China is, is, supports almost every establishment in a country. Uh, if you change your government, then we'll support a new government. Uh, we want to support all the, 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 the governments which, which are in power, which are, uh, can deal with, with China. That is vastly different from China's old strategies. I mean, in, 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 in the Cold War years, China also, I think, made mistakes in those years in supporting uh, wholeheartedly the, the so-called revolutionary movements in, in almost every country, you know, Myanmar, or Palestine, African countries. So this, ideologically, this is different from the Soviet Union. And, and I think the ide ideology, has, as, as I just said, it is still changing. Uh, it, it may not be the end uh, of the, the, the new ideas. 
we had, you know, since Model Dong, we have new, some new idea. Now we have a very new idea in the new age. But I cannot say that we will not progress into another stage of ideology. Uh, uh, and then worldview, or our attitude toward uh, the, uh, uh, the international system or the world order. Both the Soviet Union and China opposed the international order at that time uh, when the Soviet Union existed. And China changed its slogan uh, uh, in, the late, uh, in the late 1990s because before that, we still said we wanted to establish a new international order. But since the 1990s, late 1990s, the idea has changed into something like we are not totally satisfied with the world order, what you, many Americans call, uh, call liberal international order. We don't have a name. Uh, there, but simply the world order is, is conducive to us, but we are not totally satisfied. As the develop, develop country, developing country, we, do, we deserve a larger say in the World Bank, in IMF, but we are not going to undermine the current international system or international order. And to me, uh, my, my honest answer to, to this question is that, you know, uh, uh, China has its own vision of world order, uh, but that is not necessarily China is leading the world order. Still, China is quite defensive. Talking about order, I think the top priority in China is to maintain domestic order, maintained by the Communist Party of China. And when, when we talk about international order, uh, people like myself will think, well, this is led by the United States. Now the United States is, is no longer very interested in leading the international order, so we have to take more responsi responsibilities. But after all, I think the, the biggest worry in China today is, is still that the United States and some other Western countries would like to undermine China's in internal order to, um, to, to have some political uh, filtration into China. So that is what we call color revolution. I just said we don't support revolutions anywhere. Now we, 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 are, we, are, we loathe uh, uh, color revolution in other countries. And we don't want the color revolution to, to happen in China. So this is vastly also vastly different from the former Soviet Union. Another thing I think we should learn uh, lesson we should learn from the past is that the Soviet Union lost, used a lot of uh, military expenditure running a, an armed race with, uh, with the United States. At some point in history, maybe in 1970, the, the Soviet Union spent more on defense than that was the case with the United States. Now, uh, Evan said yesterday, actually, the United States and China have already engaged in some sort of arms race. I wouldn't deny that. But that is not a doctrine. That is not a doctrine yet. That in we will have to be at par with the United States. Where you have 10 or 11 aircraft carriers. We have only one, so we should build another five or another 10. Some people say that. But this, I don't think that is the military doctrine of China. But one thing I would want to emphasize is China is, is, is going to be a maritime power. So we build a strong navy, blue navy. Is that simply directed at the United States? Uh, not necessarily, because we have so many interests to protect in the world. Uh, last week, I went to Egypt. The, you know, I talked to, to the embassy people there. What, is, what worry the most? Not Egypt itself. There were worries in Egypt, but the most important thing uh, to them is the situation in Al Algeria. There are uh, 400 Chinese citizens living in Algeria. And now the country is, is, is experiencing some turbulence. Uh, the, the, the old uh, president uh, doesn't continue to control the country. 
So they are talking about how to evacu evacu ev ev evacuate, uh, uh, evacuate the, the Chinese citizens from there. Is that directed at the United States? That not, had nothing to do with the United States. But I'm imagining that in the future, when the, so China grow, uh, grows even stronger and more expensive in, in world affairs, we need more, uh, some kind of intervention, um, Chinese only intervention, to rescue our people, to protect our economic interests. And they, that, those efforts would, would not be directed at the United States. That is for China's own uh, interests. And lastly, uh, that, is my, that is my hope. Um, the Soviet Union, Union made the fatal mistake by invading Afghanistan in 1980. And that, was, that paid, paved the way for its collapse. In, not in a direct way, but it was a, it, it was a great, cons, cons, they, they in, incurred great consequences for the fate of the Soviet Union. So, but at that time, and before that, uh, the United States invaded Vietnam, and after that, the United States invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. All those military uh, campaigns at the start was very easy. It was a very weak country, uh, small, uh, militarily uh, incapable. Uh, so they, you know, the, talk, the leaders at the time thought they could win a war very easily. But now you have the consequences. The, uh, and your country, I think, is, uh, is also drawing lessons from those uh, military adventures. So I think what China has to remind itself is that you, it, when we call it uh, peaceful development or peaceful rights, we should not launch any war against uh, any uh, entity or whatever uh, without being provoked to a limit. I mean, uh, yeah, when every means can, you know, it, it, it exhausted, then you have to, to make a military decision. But I think you know that I'm referring to Taiwan. Uh, I don't think there is an easy solution to the Taiwan issue. I read very carefully Xi Jinping's speech on Taiwan uh, on uh, January 2nd this year. I actually don't see much difference from his speech and Hu Jintao's speech almost 10 years ago. So, but only. The, the interpretations are very different in Taiwan, United States, uh, and I don't believe that China is in, in any mood to make a military intervention over the Taiwan Strait, unless and uh, until the Taiwan does anything, something disastrous, uh, incurring uh, their, their uh, disaster. Uh, so I'm still cautious, cautious, cautiously optimistic about the Taiwan issue, uh, uh, I have worries, but I'm, I'm confident that we are not faced uh, with a deadly war between Taiwan and uh, mainland and between the United States and China. So I, you know, I, I confess that this is not a good time to talk about partnership or cooperation. Now we are experiencing a period when U.S.-China relations are more competitive, less cooperative, and that will last for some time to come. But there are changes, and, and I, I refer to the history. There were changes in the United States, changes in China, changes in the Soviet Union. So I'm looking forward to changes. Uh, those changes may provide us with more opportunities and some impetus for our domestic reform and further opening. Thank you. Great, thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> so Xin Bo, uh, we read in the Chinese press often that China worries there is a new Cold War mentality in the United States. Explain that a little bit to us and maybe your own views on, on where we are on the Cold War uh, scale, if you will. I guess, um, good morning everyone. Um, I think the um, comprehensive and eloquent um, presentation by uh, Professor Wang has made my um, job a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I think um, China-U.S. are entering 
uh, stage uh, featured by uh, intensifying competition. That um, seems to be very likely in the foreseeable future. Does this mean we are entering a new Cold War? Uh, no. I mean, I haven't been trained as a diplomatic historian, so I know what the Cold War is in the classical sense. Uh, if we compare China-U.S. relations today with the U.S.-Soviet Union relations during the Cold War, there exist remarkable, remarkable differences. Uh, one, I think China-U.S. competition uh, is still evolving, will be predominantly social economic, while U.S.-Soviet Union competition was predominantly political and military. So that is a big difference. Will there be geopolitical competition between China and US? Yes. But that's going to be mostly in the Western Pacific and mm. East Asia. Unlike US Soviet Union, geopolitical rivalry in a global context. So that is one reason why I don't think that is a, a classical uh, Cold War. Secondly, I think China, U.S. compete in the same, within the same international system, while U.S. and Soviet Union each created its own international system. So basically, if the U.S. won, the Soviet system, international system would collapse, mm. and vice versa. But for China and the U.S., I don't think you know, China really wanted to you know, subvert top down the current national system, having been a major, major beneficiary of the current order and international system. Yes, China is, doesn't think the current system is perfect. It needs to be fixed when there are problems, and the inadequacies should be addressed so that it can provide a better and, uh, 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 and more public goods in a more effective way. But that doesn't mean we're going to start all over again. For the US, even on the Trump administration, you know, you have withdrawing from quite a few multilateral institutions, have showing less and less interest in leading and maintaining the current international system. But I guess this is not the this is not the normalcy in US foreign policy. I hope, you know, given my study of the US. Uh, over the last several decades. So basically, China and US will continue to live within the same international system. They will compete. But the competition, to some extent, is how can we provide better public goods? How can we help shape the current institutions to make them more efficient and more sustainable? So that is a, a second major difference. The third one, in my opinion, is that we are already economically intertwined. Even though some people in town are talking about decoupling, but I guess that is just impossible. It's too late um, to decouple our two economies. The price will be too high for that. Today, I think if the US economies collapse, that will be a disaster for China and vice versa. Mm. That's very different from US and Soviet Union. They would like to see the collapse of the other economy because simply they didn't have much economic interdependence. Um, in spite of the current uh, tariff war, trade war, as we are approaching to a new trade deal, it's more likely that this will promote rather than reduce economic interdependence between two countries. And if China is going to increase the purchase of another 200 billion US dollars uh, uh, products in the next five or six years. China may become the second largest or even the first export market for the United States. So China will become economically more important to the US. This is what you may call the unintended consequence for those who want to you know, uh, decouple our two economies. So, I think if we want to look at the 
check the uh, long-term trend of this relationship, uh, we have to look at the economic dimension. The economic factor really holds the key to this relationship because for leaders in both Beijing and Washington, this is the primary incentive for them to reach out to each other and forge ties. So uh, if we are continue to have, you know, expanding economic ties between two countries, this will have the positive spillover effect on the political and military dimension, even though they will not serve the political and military uh, differences. Lastly, I think Professor Wang already uh, commented on this, the domestic trends in each country, how this will play out in this relationship. Uh, for China, in the last two years, I mean, we have, you know, every time we travel um, to this side, we keep hearing this kind of concern, complain about the uh, internal developments in China. My impression is, I think the, the so-called Chinese model of development, political, social, economic, is far from being fixed. We are still in the process of, you know, uh, searching for a uh, uh, um, new model of governing a country like China in a way that matches the trend of 21st century. So China is not just rising, it's also learning, adjusting, and transforming itself. Evolving. Evolving. Within China, you see different trends, actually, socially, economically, and politically. And these trends, actually, they interact with each other and then help shape the outcome of China's development in the long term. Uh, likewise, on the US side, I mean, in the last several years, the entire world feel very uncomfortable when they say, you know, the US is becoming more unilateralist, protectionist, and even sometimes racist. I mean, that makes outside observers very uncomfortable. Will this be the long-term trend of the US? No, there always exist different opinions in this country, mm. different policy preferences. So maybe we are experiencing a kind of a unique period, but we should be careful not to take this as a long-term uh, trend. So if we are thinking about these you know, uh, factors and to say how this will shape uh, this relationship. Yes, there will be intensifying competition, largely because of China's growing capability, growing aspiration, growing influence, and also the, the reaction from the US side to the rise of China. Uh, does this mean we are going to return a, a, a Cold War style mode of relationship? No. If, People say this is a cool, this is a new Cold War. It's not not because the relationship will be you know like the classic Cold War, but because people choose to have a Cold War thinking when they think about this relationship. So in this regard, I would say we should be careful in our narrative about this relationship and now, and be careful with our prediction about the future trend of this very important uh, relationship. In the United States, in Washington in particular, I can, every time I can, uh, uh, in the last two years, I can feel this kind of heat, you know, heating frustration, uh, anxiety of China. But frustration and anxiety does not provide a good base for making rational and uh, effective foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So I think it's our job, it's job for all people who are present here that when there's kind of you know, sentimental mood, we should be careful not to be carried away by it. I mean, we should take a very calm and less alarmist view of this relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So. And so, Evan, um, you've heard our two first speakers. Thanks, Liam. 
Um, and they sort of said, not a Cold War. I'd like to hear your views on that. But I'd also like you to um, look at this question, particularly of, is China a revisionist power from the American perspective, and sort of where that debate is in the United States? I think those, those are great questions, Dennis, because there's, in, in some ways, there's sort of bookends to the contemporary American debate. But before I begin, I want to thank Ji Su and our other Chinese friends for uh, coming. I uh, first met Wang Ji Su about 20 years ago when I was a PhD student. And I sent a fax off to the Institute of American Studies, the Megwaso. And I was a PhD student. I was looking for a place to go as a visiting fellow, not realizing that 20 years ago, China didn't really do visiting fellows, or at least CAS didn't at the time. His but nickname at the time was uh, Xiao Mai. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you still call me that. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I was very fortunate because they uh, agreed to let me come to the Institute of American Studies, and I was subsequently the first sort of real um, American visiting fellow. And I spent a year there doing my dissertation research and learned an enormous amount about the China's Suwei Fangshu and the way they think about the world and met lots of great friends and academics. So it's a, it's a pleasure for me, fast forward 20 years, to be sitting here with such good friends and colleagues. Um, and let me just echo what Xin Bo said. Um, Attitude and sentiment is not a good way to make policy. And I say that as both a scholar and as somebody that was directly involved in policy making. Um, and it gets heated on both sides. Um, you know, wh whether it's preparing for a state visit or negotiating a bilateral joint statement or a trade negotiation, um, things are hard in the US-China relationship. And people get tired and they get stressed out. Um, but that cannot be a way, cannot be a basis for making policy. And I share Shin Bo's admonition that attitude more than sort of syst systematic strategic analysis is driving uh, US policy. So on this issue of a Cold War, um, I, I think we all need to be concerned about the trajectory the relationship is on. And I choose that word very deliberately, trajectory in the sense of we all know that the relationship is more competitive. That's not new or terribly interesting. But when I think about the trajectory, it's that the competition is expanding and accelerating in very, very worrisome ways. Um, do I believe it's a Cold War? Uh, no, it's the wrong analogy. Because in the Cold War, it was defined by deep ideological differences and competing worldviews that doesn't really exist um, Two economies that were basically disconnected from one another. And then nuclear weapons were at the forefront. And there are other dimensions to it as well. And there's this wonderful series of essays in China File. I, I wrote one of them that look at these questions that I recommend everybody uh, read if you're interested. But saying that it's not a Cold War is not meant to minimize where we are. In fact, it sort of, in many ways, it distracts from the more worrisome direction of the US-China relationship. In the, you know, the great saying, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Unfortunately, the rhyme is a pretty bad sounding rhyme. Because what I see is this convergence of cyclical and short-term forces and structural and long-term forces that are both pushing the relationship in the direction of rivalry. And by short term, I mean the dimensions of Trump's China policy. By structural or long term, I mean those forces that have been in place for a while and will likely persist regardless of who's president. And the part of this equation that particularly concerns me is the traditional forces that served as stabilizers and buffers are very, very rapidly uh, fading away. And when you have a situation of strong drivers and accelerants, short term and long term, and fading uh, buffers and stabilizers, the relationship could go off the rails um, uh, over time. And it, it very much worries me. And one of the, to get back to Dennis's question, I think one of the uh, structural drivers 
is this issue of sort of revisionism. And Shin Bo made a very important point, which is the narratives on both sides are different. And what I worry is they become starkly different in recent years. Uh, you, you heard the Chinese perspective. Uh, we're focused on our domestic tasks, growth and Communist Party legitimacy. We've got a lot of them, and we have a long way to go. Uh, externally, we're looking for our external policy is largely driven by meeting our domestic needs. And we have a very modest view of our role internationally. And we're just looking to create more space and more voice opportunities for China. Um, that's a very Chinese perspective. It's not shared by most Americans. It's not shared by me. Um, because I think that when you look at the policies that Xi Jinping is pursuing, uh, it looks uh, far more ambitious than that. And one of the challenges that we face is that you know, China talks about just sort of you know, modifying some of the rules so we have a voice that's representative of our large economy and our capabilities. But in fact, when you look at some of the actual behavior, what it looks like is China wants to have some of those opportunities, changing the, the vote distribution in the IMF and the World Bank. That's a good thing. But China is also dissatisfied with some aspects of the current international system and believes that the US and other powers have too much power and influence and want to seek to minimize that, right? I mean, the Chinese talk a lot about renminbi internationalization, that uh, the US and Europe have uh, too great a role in international financial institutions. Um, certainly on the more liberal dimensions of the liberal international order, questions of human rights and activities at the UN Human Rights Commission, uh, China wants to undercut those efforts. When the Permanent Commission on Arbitration made its ruling in 2016, even though China is a signatory to UNCLOS, China completely invalidated because it, it was inconsistent with its interests. So clearly, from my perspective, China has one foot in the system and one foot outside of the system. And the, the question many Americans are asking is, the trajectory of that looks like as China's capabilities grow, China will basically pick and choose those dimensions of the international system that it wants to abide by and that it doesn't want to abide by. And a lot of this comes to a head on economic questions because China outwardly talks about supporting globalization and international trade. From an American perspective, we look at the way China operates its economy, and it's only restricting the role of market forces. The rise of industrial policy, the rise of subsidies. Of course, everybody I'm sure is familiar with the uh, issues related to FDI, IP protection, forced technology transfer. And then as Americans, we look at w what appears to be sort of an expansion of the role of the Communist Party and uh, a sort of new uh, interest in not just Leninism, but Marxism as well. And the treatment of ethnic and religious minorities is a source of concern. So, you know, on this question of revisionism, I think Americans are going to continue to debate it. I think the narratives on both sides are very different, and I think it's going to be very, very difficult uh, for us to bridge them. And so the question becomes, are there, you know, what, what are the solutions to this? Well, I think one of them is, can we find big global projects to cooperate on? And on that, I'm, I'm a little bit cynical, um, uh, both because of American motives and Chinese motives. Um, on the US side, the US withdrew from the Paris Accord and climate change, which was a signature achievement of the Obama administration. And I think it's due to the leadership of both President Obama and President Xi, so there was um, strong efforts made on both sides. But, but here's the problem. Not all interests and areas of cooperation are born equally. In other words, they're not of equivalent value. And when you have Americans you know, asking about the political trajectory of China and whether or not uh, our ideas, maybe not ideology, but our ideas of economic and political governance seem to be diverging, not converging, and China seems ambivalent about the current international order, um, 
if we don't have any of these cooperative projects and China sees cooperation as you know, a way to gain leverage over the United States. I mean, the example I often like to use is one of the dialogues we created in the Obama administration was the Asia Pacific consultations between Kurt Campbell and Sui Tian Kai, and I sat in all of them. And it was one of the most strategic, far-ranging discussions, in large part because you had two very big intellects in Kurt Campbell and Sui Tian Kai that were able to have a very broad-ranging dialogue. But at the end of the day, what were the cooperative projects we agreed on? Agriculture in East Timor, right? That's it. And so the suspicion about American motives um, on the Chinese side is deep and wide ranging. And while I know that very sophisticated scholars, they've spent a lot of time interacting with the West, may not share as deep insecurities, I'm very confident that the top leadership does. I've been in plenty of meetings, Xi Jinping, um, Yang Jiechi, Wang Yi, Li Jianshu, Wang Huning, at the very top there is a, I, I believe, a deep and profound insecurity about the United States that goes to different ideas of economic and political governance, concerns about color revolutions, and that fundamentally constrains our ability to work together on issues. So I very much agree with Xin Bo. If we can find ways to contribute to global public goods, we should absolutely do so. I'm just worried that the political environment in both sides uh, won't create that environment. Great, thank you. <laughs> so Shui Lan, you come at this from a very different perspective from our other three panelists. You're an economist. Uh, Xin Bo has just said that economics is both at the center of the cooperation and the competition in the US-China relationship. So maybe you can take it from, from the S&T and economic perspective. Well, I, I think first of all, I think thanks very much for inviting me to this uh, uh, panel discussion. And uh, I was uh, here, I think, uh, you know, in about 25 years ago at Georgetown and giving a public lecture uh, when I was teaching at George Washington University. And it was, you know, I came here to the public policy, I think at the time it was called the Public Policy Institute. And uh, I think it was uh, in a regular sort of uh, seminar room. So this certainly is an upgrade. <laughs> 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 so I'm very happy that uh, finally I earned my due uh, over the years. <laughs> um, I, I, I also, by, I have to clarify, I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm a, I would sort of say policy and a public policy person. Mm. I do innovation policy and so on. Uh, and I think that um, let me first comment on the, you know, the, the, your word about the, you know, the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I think actually, first of all, I think if you look at China, China is now in, indeed is engaging a war domestically. It's a war on poverty. And I think China is you know, determined to, you know, elem, elem, you know, so at least you know, to, to try to you know, uh, uh, about, you know, eliminate the poverty by the year of mm -hmm. 2020. So that's an war. I think if you think about globally, I would say that indeed there is in, might be a, a war on development ideas. I think that uh, if you think about uh, you know the uh, you know the, the, the you know I, I've also my, myself engaged in some sort of studies on the you know development series and so on. I think if you think about after World War II. You know, we have a lot of you know global institutions supporting you know uh, developing countries and so on, but I think that uh, successes are quite limited. Mm -hmm. And so, if you look, if you you go to the development economists, they would argue China is probably the biggest success, mm -hmm. right? So I think that that actually I, I think you know if you think about development ideas. So somehow, uh, there is something that in, in China's development uh, you know, story that there probably that can be, we can learn from, and that might be useful for, for the world. And so I think that if you are talking about you know, China is now trying to, uh, you know, uh, to, to have more influence in the global scene, I think China was probably just simply sharing what uh, you know, China has had and then see, 
again, every time that, you know, we actually have a, uh, I used to be the dean of public policy school at Tsinghua University, and we started an international program in the year 2007. And from, you know, we have uh, you know, a lot of students from developing countries. And every time we are very clear, you know, you know, of our faculty members, you know, we are trying to just describe what China has gone through. So I think you basically we want the student to be careful in learning what China has, both its successes, but also its failures. I think that we have to be very clear. I think over the years, China has also made a lot of mistakes in its development. At least my own you know, observation is that you know, China in terms of the environment. China started very early on in having a, you know, a set of, you know, sort of a, uh, policies and regulations on the envi environment. But in terms of enforcing, enforcement on the environment, it's not until very recently that really I think that become an issue. So I think that that's a lesson that we should, I think, also share with our, you know, developing country, uh, you know, uh, partners. So I think, you know, I would argue that maybe that's a, a, a story that, that, you know, that's the kind of experience that the world can, 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 can be shared. Um, so I think that the U.S. and China could work to get together to promote development in, in, the, uh, in, the, in Africa and in many other, other places. And I think the world peace would be much better. So I, I don't see that as a war, but I think it actually there could, could be a lot of opportunities for cooperation. Um, now getting back to the science and technology area uh, that, that I mentioned the last year, I mean, the, this year, you know, I think was, you know, 40 years of US-China sort of, you know, agreement on, on, you know, collaboration on science and technology. I think over the years, I think both countries have engaged in very wide range of collaborations for all, of all kinds, uh, you know, in terms of the exchange of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, faculty and then students, uh, and, uh, and also in terms of a collaboration among institutions, academic research institutions, and also in terms of the, uh, you know, multinational collaborations. Uh, for example, I think that actually, uh, uh, um, you know, I've done quite some studies on this. Uh, I think about um, uh, close to one third of China's international publications. I think China's international publications now it's, it's, you know, in general, it's about close to the amount of the U.S. publications. About one third of that is through international collaboration, and the largest amount of the, all international collaborations is with the U.S. Uh, you know, partners. So I think there's a very strong, very deep, you know, connections among the uh, scholars uh, in, in, in about the two countries. And also in terms of the multinational engagement, I think the, uh, I studied multinational R&D centers in late 1990s. At the time of the, you know, Fortune 1000 company, over 30 countries, uh, over 30 uh, autonomous uh, R&D centers were set up uh, in China. Most of that was from the U.S. And, and so I, I think, you know, I can go on many of these collaborations. So I think that's really benefited more enormously uh, to both countries. And so, so I think that um, to, it's ironic now when we think about what's the fundamental cause of this current, you know, what you call the war. I think in part you can say Maybe it's China's economic success. But you can also argue that this success, in a way, is achieved precisely through, I think, China's learning many of the experiences of the US, Japan, and other countries. So in a way, a lot of people say that Chinese development model is very similar to that of, they say, Japan and East Tigers. Uh, so I think that, in a way, I think we all should celebrate the success, and then see how actually China indeed can you know, work together and to help others in, in, in moving along this path, I think the world would be a much, much better place. I think that, you know, I think that's sort of at least you know, my comment on, on the Cold War. I think I, I'm not an international scholar, mm -hmm. international relations scholar, so 
I always find this uh, sort of quite ironic now. We are getting in this uh, debate about the Cold War. Uh, so I don't see there's a Cold War. But also, let me say that, okay, now suppose we are indeed in, in this kind of a mentality. Of course, every I think the you know, country to country relationship, there are always kind of three parts, I, what I see. One part of the issue is real competition. You know, I think that uh, maybe in, 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 in some defense area, in some influence area, and, and resource and so on. The second part is sort of more of the co-competition in economic front. And the third would be that there could be clear collaboration. So I think maybe that uh, I think it's a time we can think about how can we be clear on what issues that indeed we, are, we have to be very careful that's sort of more of a competition based. What are the issues that actually there could be collaboration, as uh, I think uh, 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 Ivan uh, you know, said? And then where are these issues that actually this sort of co-competition that we need to, you know, to see how we can actually improve? I think the co-competition on the economic side, I would say, mostly say, you know, uh, at the, the industrial company uh, based. I think that uh, on many of the issues, that, for example, in terms of the IPR protection and uh, industrial policy, uh, I think that um, we may actually need to uh, do a bit more uh, careful study before I think uh, launching this, um, uh, you know, sort of attack on each side. I think on, on the IPR, I, you know, I, I happen to do the work on the innovation studies. I think if you uh, honestly looking at the history of uh, China's IPR system, China started the patent system in 1986. Almost also, you know, scholarly studies and also the, uh, you know, the, the WIPO, uh, they would all recognize that China has achieved tremendous progress over the years. And I think that uh, uh, one could argue that uh, indeed, I think working with, uh, um, you know, with, with, with uh, WIPO and with, uh, you know, many uh, other international organizations, that uh, China is going to improve further. I think you, we already see some new movement on you know, new uh, strategies of the government in, in pushing on this front. So I think that uh, uh, from that point of view, I think that you can only see, see that actually, you know, the whole situation will improve further. So I think overall, I think the, with a better uh, uh, engagement and collaboration, we'll see that uh, China is also now able to offer more products and service to the world. And so I think that should be, you know, help, that should be helpful and it should be a good thing for the world and also for the U.S. and for China. Uh, so I think that's sort of, at least I would argue that uh, it's a, uh, you know, if it's, it's a cold war, I think it's a, let's make it a war on ideas, not more a war on, <laughs> on, on sort of hard competitions. Thank you. I will uh, leave time for the audience questions, but I, I'm going to continue to take my prerogative for a couple more minutes. Um, one of the things that struck me yesterday that uh, was said by one of our Chinese colleagues from a think tank, he said that a study had been done last year in Beijing, I think it was at his think tank, although I may not have this right, that said 2018 was the worst year in the 40 years since normalization. But that 2018 will be the best year in the next 40 years of U.S.-China relations. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not true. <laughs> and I, I'd like you all to, to react to that, but I'd also like you to think about if you had one or two recommendations to either U.S. government or Chinese government, how do we avoid that future? What, what, what do you think is key to avoiding a future in which the next 40 years are worse than the last 40 years? I wish I would uh, survive the next 40 years. <laughs> 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 but I'm a little bit uh, impatient. I think I think we, we can we can do a lot. 
Uh, what worries me most uh, in these few days is first of all uh, the lack of truly strategic, meaningful dialogues between the two sides. Uh, I remember the old days, golden old days, when we also had problem with the United States, EP3 or embassy bombing, leading with visit to the United States, a lot of things. But then we, we restored very quickly from the from the, part, the crisis because we had people knowing each other uh, on, on each side. We had you, we had uh, Evan Medeiros, we had quite a few people in the United States that we got to know each other for some time. But now the people who are controlling China policy or Asian policy, how much do we know them and how much do they, they, they know us? And how many conversations they are having together? That is the biggest worry I have now. Uh, because you have you have Liu He came in here many times, they, and they have a, a strong team, talk to each other regularly. But how about security people and uh, diplomats? Th that linkage is is very much shaken. Uh, unless and until we have those kind of truly strategic dialogues, you can you know when the crisis rises up, it's difficult to restore to the uh, to the normality. Uh, and but it is the truth. I'm not blaming the United States, but I simply say that the people who are in charge of China policy, they are they are they are still or even not uh, inaugurated yet uh, <laughs> or, or whatever. Uh, and you have confirmed by the Senate. Yeah. Yes, constantly uh, changing. Yeah, the, the, uh, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, uh, National Security. Uh, advisor, uh, no, but that, that also gives me some hope because if have more changes in the future, and then you will have some. Maybe you will have will have more familiar faces, or they, they can uh, accumulate their experiences with China. The second thing I'm worried about, uh, although I believe Hu Jin Boy is right that the uh, decoupling in, in economic terms is not it's not possible, it's not advisable, but there is already the decoupling uh, or the technological decoupling, and that will have great confidence, confidences, uh, great great uh, con uh, no, uh, consequences, um, or, or, or very negative consequences. So that is related to the third worry I have. That is the, uh, the downgrading of uh, scholarly exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when in, in 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 the last few years, when we talked about U.S.-China relations, we talked about three legs: economy, security, and uh, humanitarian exchanges. Now the humanitarian just are, you know are. Uh, uh, are in big trouble. We have visa problems of, from from the United States to China, or from China to the United States, and students do not know how many years they can spend here, and that in the long run may hurt uh, technological transfer and technological competition uh, will, will rise up. Um, so I, I'm not thinking about what what's going to happen in uh, in, in 40 years. <laughs> But I confess I have a, a, a state uh, a sponsored uh, research program which uh, asked me to predict the future uh, of uh, 249, the, the 100th anniversary of China, you know, the establishment of the People's Republic of China. Um, but I, I think it is very certain that 40 years from now, in China, in the United States, there will be very, very significant domestic changes. And I, I, I hope we are, we are moving in the right direction. Um, I'm somewhat confident because I, uh, I'm, I'm getting old. I, you know, I remember what, what was the, the China I saw 40 years ago. Mm. So do I have enough confidence that China will get to a better state in 40 years? I think so.
So in, in, if we are, we are getting better in 40 years, uh, it's not exactly what people hope, but it's, there, there will be a vastly different China. Great. Shin Bo? Well, um, I certainly don't buy the, uh, the argument made by uh, my colleagues you mentioned, because uh, the trajectory of this relationship in the next 40 years is far from being uh, preordained. Um, it's uh, still an open uh, question. Um, now, Evan just mentioned, you know, how um, he vision, envisioned the future of China through his experience of, you know, um, observing the top Chinese leaders, you know, uh, when he served in the government. I know American scholars, you know, on China, when they study China, they read the People's Daily, maybe watch CCTV, and also read the leader's speech. And they think that is China. And Xinhua, too. Xinhua, too. <laughs> <laughs> but when I teach at Fudan University, every year I have thousands of uh, fresh faces enter the university from 18 to 19 years old. When I see their thinking, the aspiration, their way of life, I think in the long term, if you think about 40 years, next 40 years, I think it's more likely to be this generation to define the future of China. I mean, like in every country, when the new leaders come into power, they want to define and redefine the world in their own way, according to their own preference. But in the end, most leaders will come to realize that you know, the world may not be exactly um, redefined as they wish in every country. So if I believe in Marxism, one important thing is that I believe it is a social economic currents, foundations, that define the political superstructure, not the other way around. I think it's the truth. I think it's the truth. Marxism has a lot of truth. That is why you know, many people still believe it. Now, think about the interactions between China and U.S. I can feel, I can, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of sympathetic to the U.S. side because after the U.S. became the number one coming out of World War II, you deal with Soviet Union, right? You deal with Japan, Germany. Now it's China. China is, to a large extent, very different from Soviet Union and from the re-emerging Japan and Germany. So at some point, the US feels kind of at a loss about how to manage this uh, relationship, which is becoming more uh, competitive. If I'm going to make one recommendation, I'm going to make one for each side, OK, to be even. <laughs> um, for the U.S. side, I think Americans, leaders, public, uh, 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 political elites, they have to come to realize that in this world, there are different types of governance. It's not just one way of governance works for all. No matter you like it or not, that's going to be the reality, simply because countries have different culture, history, religious background, all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Internally, the Americans, they like to talk about diversity, pluralism, you know, free choice, these kind of things. Internationally, the, the US always likes to say just one model of political system and governance system. I think that this is not realistic. This is not realistic. Um, I mean, just like the book, the famous book, um, The End of History. History never ends. Mm. History just runs its own course. Um, if I'm going to make a recommendation for Chinese um, leaders, maybe I should make a recommendation to Professor Wang. <laughs> he will relay this to the Chinese leaders. 
<laughs> That's the biggest lie he has. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think certainly I agree with uh, uh, um, Professor Xie Lan that China is a very successful developing country in terms of you know uh, developing economy and bring um, eight million. Uh, 800 million people out of poverty. That's a miracle in history. But I think China is still in the search for a governance system that is modern and also matches the trends in the 21st century. Mm. Actually, this is what President Xi said exactly after he became the top leader in China, that a paramount, paramount challenge for him and this leadership is to modernize China's governing capacity and governing system. I think we are still on the way. Yes, we have our own history, culture, and social conditions. But in the end, when we are in the 21st century, every country has to embrace modernity modernity in its way of governance. And in this regard, I believe China still has a long way to go. Evan? So I'll make four recommendations for both sides. OK. <laughs> uh, you're bringing out the old policymaker, yeah, in Dennis. Yeah, got to. Yeah. Uh, number one, um, don't demonize the other. Sounds like an obvious point. But the way the debate in the United mm. States is going, I, I'm deeply concerned that we're beginning to see every move China makes as directed against the United States and as pernicious. And I worry in particular, obviously, as a, a professor at, at an educational institution, that it's going to begin to affect the intellectual environment in American universities. It's a very, very worrisome trend, right? When we have senior U.S. officials talking about, you know, Chinese students as a threat on American campuses, I mean, we, we should all be concerned. But similarly, um, when you look at Chinese media and Chinese press, there's a lot of demonization of the United States as well, seeing American color revolutions around every corner, right? When Americans criticize the treatment of ethnic and religious minorities, what's going on in Xinjiang, the way the Tibetans are created, that's not directed at bringing down the Communist Party. That's genuinely concern about what we believe are universal rights for the treatment of ethnic and religious minorities. So don't demonize. Number two, we need to have real strategic dialogue. That, again, is not meant to be a bromide. The issue is, how do you define real? One of the things we attempted to do in the Obama administration was I created a channel between Tom Donlin and Dai Bing Guo. And I had to convince Tom to do this. National Security Advisor is the busy, busiest person in the US government, as Dennis knows. And to try and convince the National Security Advisor to take several days to fly over to China and or to spend time on the margins of major multilateral meetings is significant. Um, and those dialogues are critical because at best, at best what you can do, given the limits of the US-China relationship, is prevent the entrenchment of worst case assessments. But you know what? That's actually pretty important in the US-China relationship. You know, at best. Maybe, you know, if you're lucky, you can solve a couple problems along the way. But the fact that there's really no equivalent to the National Security Advisor in China um, is just sort of the beginning of the constraints. But you have to have that sustained strategic dialogue. And the question is, you know, who in the Chinese government has Xi Jinping given that, that sort of has the political space and the political credibility to play that particular role? Because the National Security Advisor sees the president every morning, at the end of every day, and multiple times during the day. You know, who plays that role in China? I'm still not clear. Point number three, uh, we need to have a real problem-solving agenda. In other words, we simply can't have dialogue for the sake of dialogue. And one of the very legitimate criticisms of the Obama administration was we created this great superstructure of dialogue, but we didn't really get anything done, right? In particular, this applies to the strategic and economic dialogue. 
And you know, the Chinese were very happy. You know, when we raised complaints about market access, IP, forced tech transfer, all the things being debated, uh, being negotiated right now, the Chinese response is, great, let's meet and sit down and talk about them. Um, and no progress was made. And as a result, grievances and frustrations accumulated. And that brought us to the point of today, which is debating about decoupling our economies, uh, et cetera. So we really have to solve problems. And that requires political leadership from the top to tell their top advisors, solve problems. Don't come back to me and just say that we met. And the fourth and final point is we really need to think about a serious cooperative agenda. And by a cooperative agenda, what I mean is uh, working together on problems that really matter. Cooperation is not a way for China to manage the United States, which in the Obama years, it had sort of had that feeling sometimes, that the Chinese were trying to prevent the Obama administration from becoming too frustrated and confrontational, so let's find a couple areas to work on. Now, of course, we you know, hit one good area on climate change, but I'll tell you, it took several years of trying to persuade the Chinese leadership that they need to care about this as much as we did. And it was only when the leadership changed from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping that we actually made some progress on this in 2014. Now, of course, a lot of that sort of sense of solving common threats was washed away by what was going on in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. So we need to think about a cooperative agenda that's very mutual and proactive, um, and I think you know, those four will, would help change the trajectory of the relationship. Sri Lanka. Well, I, I can easily say that I agree with all of us here at <laughs> proposals. And, uh, uh, but but I, I think, first of all, I think in, in the comment that, that was made, I would argue that very soon, I think, uh, you know, probably the, the history will prove that prediction was wrong. I, th I think in, in the fact that I think both China and the U.S., despite these are the two you know, largest countries in the world, are both, I think, one sim similarity of these two countries. These two countries are all very dynamic, <coughs> flexible, and innovative. If you look at the U.S. history, I mean, U.S. Mm -hmm. has also been evolving. I mean, China has also been you know, shown that over the last 40 years. So I think that I trust, I think that similarity would help us to weather through this kind of a currently seeming as a very dangerous uh, trajectory that we are moving into. But I, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, things will prove uh, us wrong. And also, I think, of course, there might be surprises that we might have some common uh, challenges that we have to face uh, before uh, you know, the 40 years uh, the, the, yeah, the, to come. Now, in terms of specific <coughs> proposals, I think for me it's very easy. The first one, come to Schwarzman, Schwarzman College. <laughs> uh, but I really mean that, that is, yeah. I think that, as, as you've already all said, that indeed, I think in the past, you know, the people in the US that's dealing with US-China relationship are the people who have studied, who un really understand the complexity of China issue. I think that anybody who spent, you know, a few months in, in China, the one word that they always say is complexity. Right? So I think that without a deep understanding of what the complexity of China, it'd be very difficult to make any sort of easy judgment and also in terms of decisions. So I think that having more people, particularly young people, to come to China to study, and also not just to, to go to Beijing, Shanghai, and, and this big city, but rather also go to you know, so other places, Baoji and, uh, you know, Gansu, Guizhou, so they really see the complexity of China. I think then they have a much better sense. It's interesting because one of the things we tell Chinese now hmm. is you, you, you need to get away from the two coasts exactly. and go to the Midwest, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I was, yeah. what I was going to say, that the, the Chinese students coming to the U.S. also, I think particularly the young people, they come to the campus and then study and then they go, you know, some of them stay or others, you know, go back. But again, they don't have that really understanding of the complexity of the U.S. as well. So I think that part, I think there's a need to, uh, you know, I think we, 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 can, we can try to improve. I think also the Chinese students who study in the here, I think they should also 
understand China better. I think you know, some of the Chinese students who studied in the US, they do not understand China as well. Interesting. Uh, you know, I think our generation, probably you know, we've all gone to the countryside or whatever. Mm -hmm. We had our first, I mean, I call it social university. <laughs> and then, you know, I, you know I, I think that university was actually as equally important as the campus university. And I think so, so I think that's sort of the, the first thing that I would argue that you know, we, we can all improve. Uh, I know that you know, now it's a bit hard to convince you know, the uh, you know, uh, American uh, young people to, to, to go to China. I think fortunately at the Schwarzman College, we are still having this very strong application that's every year. So, but I hope that there'll be more of those programs that, that actually can attract uh, the, the American young people. I think the second thing that uh, was very similar to, uh, to the ideas, uh, uh, you know, events, so that, you know, uh, uh, events, so that, you know, uh, made, that is, we need to have a, a mechanism, uh, for, um, not just dialogue, uh, but also I think, uh, as a as a mechanism to build trust. If you think about over the years, of the last forty years, I think one thing that you know, we have not made much progress, is that there's still deeply rooted distrust. I mean, I was, you know, I mean, was, uh, uh, Evans, we just talked about the top leadership's concern about the color revolution and so on. I think on the U.S. side, there must be also, you know, very similar sort of distrust about China's, you know, color uh, revolution uh, uh, against uh, uh, us. Well, so, so the, <laughs> what's China's intention of right. grabbing the world, whatever. I mean, so, right. so, I, I think that. I feel flattered. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that um, somehow the mechanism has to, you know, one is to how do you build trust, but also and also solving a problem. So I think that I see there are many areas uh, that actually we can think about. For example, in terms of uh, you know some new emerging technologies that really need a clear global governance system that actually to prevent you know, the potential uh, risks to the human society. And I, see, I think there, you know, certainly I think that uh, there could be common interests. But also I think without managing that, there could also be uh, you know, a, a real problem for the two countries. So I think that sort of probably is, is, is something that we also need to think about. And the third I would say is that we need to have a sort of a, a contingency plan or contingency mechanism to, uh, to allow the two countries to deal with some unexpected events right. in, a, in, a, in a sort of more rational and uh, reasonable way. Right. And I think clearly, I mean, you've already mentioned a few mm -hmm. you know, mishaps in, in the last uh, you know, 40 years. And you know, God knows what's gonna happen in the future. So I think that kind of a plan, I think it's, you know, uh, would help us to weather through those kind of crises that in case of, the, you know, they happen. Excellent. So now it's your turn. I'm sure you have lots of questions. Uh, we do have microphones coming around. So if you just mm -hmm. state who mm -hmm. you are, and if, if we could please keep them to short questions so we can get as many of them in as, as possible. So Toya, are you, are you ready? Um, <coughs> I'm going to ask Ambassador Block to be the first questioner here. Thank you, Dennis. Let me first congratulate you for putting oh. together such a stellar panel. This is one of the best discussions on U.S.-China relations I've heard recently. But I would like to go back to the question, a very important question that Wu Xingbo raised. Okay. He said the United States should give up the idea that there's only one form of governance. And that China is still, he was quite vague in that regard, is still searching for a kind of governance for the 21st century, or mo modern, modern governance. Modern. Okay. You're really asking America to give up American democracy. It's, it's like asking China to give up communism. So I wonder whether you can go deeper uh, into how you see China's governance or society changing in the next 40 years. And you know I'm a great admirer of yours. And you said, in 40 years, China will be better. 
you know that fundamentally, that is the question between the, to me, between the United States and China. Recently, I taught a class for a friend. And the fundamental question among the students was what kind of world do you want to live in in the next, they said, 20 years? Do you want the Chinese model or do you want the American model? And there are great differences. The, we have, I, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Shirley, I, I don't know you. I, this is the first time I met you, but mm -hmm. we have two of the top Chinese Americanists with us today. I really would like to hear from you. What is the China of the future? Big question. Well, um, I'm not really asking America to give up its own democracy. What I mean is that the U.S. should um, control its impulse to make the rest of the world like the U.S. Uh, either through diplomatic means or through military action, whatever. Uh, regime change, color revolution, you have tried all of them uh, without much uh, success. So uh, every country at the end of the day has to find its own way of governance. And there are both similarity and differences in those ways of governance. And when, you, when we talk about the Chinese model of, and, and the American model, we have to be careful because it sounds like these two models are totally different. As I don't think that is going to be the case. Going to be the case. That's what I talk about the modernity. The modernity. I mean, it's just like people who are here today. I'm Chinese, you're American, different hair color, different race. But I think we have some similarity. That's why we can sit here and we can communicate. We're all human beings. So in this regard, I think the US can develop a more sophisticated and realistic view of its relations with the outside world. So especially in relation with China, because I understand this kind of missionary complex that has featured this relationship for many decades. Now, Will China be certainly be better off 40 years from now? I think so. I think so. Because, as I mentioned, I think China's future trajectory will be largely uh, de um, determined or shaped by the deep social economic currents. So, I mean, political leaders are always important, but I think this kind of social economic uh, currents are even more important. If China continue to pursue economic reform to allow private sector foreign investment to play a large role in China's overall economic development, China, will con China continues to engage the rest of the world, including the United States. That kind of trends will shape the future China, and I believe will make China better off. Uh, I take this opportunity to pro do my to a, do a promotion of my new book. <laughs> uh, actually, it's very relevant to China. This new book is entitled uh, "Ultimate Goals in World Politics." I identified five. Uh, the first, the second are not very familiar to us, that is peace and development, or I rephrase them as uh, security and wealth. You make money, nobody, nobody is against it. And peace or stability or now security, but security should include non-traditional security issues like climate change, environmental protection. These are th two things that people do not change, do not challenge me in China, but the, the other three I think are equally important. I don't have the order of priority. The third one is belief or faith. In the United States, people have, have beliefs and, or, or faith, and I, I went to your office yesterday. I took, I stole the book, which was entitled something like Faith 
and what? Faith and what? <laughs> but in China, what is our faith? The, our faith is simply one now, China, China, China. What is the, what's the, the ultimate goal of China? So, we, well, not, I'm not promoting uh, uh, religious beliefs necessarily, but we have to you know, have some social m morality. You know, you know, that kind of, you know, to be a good citizen. And you have uh, several standards, you don't cheat. You don't uh, 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 do wrong things, but that is very much a discussion in China today. That is, what is our faith? What is our belief system? The second thing, in addition to the the third, uh, the the uh, is is justice, social justice mm -hmm. that should be rule ba based rule rule by law, rule on rule of law, not rule by by law, and. And you know, uh, justice should include equality, uh, some kind of uh, you know dignity, uh, and you know because we are faced with increased uh, inequality, social and uh, and cultural and, and and especially economic inequality in China today. It is worldwide, but in China we are faced with this kind of uh, 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 justice problem. The last one. That is not very faithfully received in China. Freedom, which respect personal freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of uh, of social uh, 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 what you call uh, socialization, uh, political uh, freedom as well. Of course, it is sensitive, but freedom is recorded in our socialist values. Uh, you know, 24 characters of socialist values. Uh, so it, it, there's nothing wrong. And, and I, re I, I refer to Mao Zedong's writing in the 1940s when he, in a single article, he referred to freedom uh, 68 times. <laughs> so, so I don't. I, don't, I, I do think that we will enjoy more, more freedom, more justice, and, and we have raised our level of, uh, of morality in the near future. So that would, is the China I'm hoping for. I'm, I, I, I'm still hopeful with the younger generation. Of course, they will, they will not be against any single uh, goal I'm describing. So I'm still somewhat confident. Let's see, I want to get a student next. Um, mm -hmm. How about this young man right here in the white shirt? Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, I'm Milo. I'm with the U.S. Taiwan Business Council. So I have a question on Taiwan. So um, there is a, um, so as you mentioned. Oh, I failed on that one. Okay. <laughs> 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 yes. So um, Taiwan is kind of stuck in this weird relationship between the U.S. and China where even though Taiwan and the U.S. both have shared interests, for example, in the tech supply chain and innovation, as um, the professor mentioned, but it also has an ambiguous situation where U.S. is trying to uphold democracy in Taiwan, and while um, China has not renounced the use of force, as mentioned in uh, Xi Jinping's January speech. So I was wondering what um, the experts think is the future of Taiwan in basically uh, stuck between this great power struggle between China and the US. Who wants to take a shot at this? <laughs> <laughs> he studied his speech very carefully. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> first of all, Taiwan is part of China. <laughs> but it's up to the Taiwanese to, to identify themselves. So you, know, you have a, you have a, 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 a identity problem, I think, I confess. And I went to Taiwan a few weeks ago. Uh, I thought I just wanted to spend a holiday there. And I was afraid that the, the authorities in Beijing would stop me from going there because they thought I was somewhat sensitive to the Taiwanese. But actually, it was no problem on the Chinese side. But the Taiwan authorities asked me the question, 
uh, do you have any uh, intentions to do political activities in Taiwan? <laughs> I said, no, I, I'm just spending holiday with my wife. We will have the tourist visa is too, too short, only 15 days. So I wanted to spend more than 15 days. So I enjoyed myself there. So I see, you know, it is a very traditional Chinese society. You know, you can say it is Taiwanese society. I have no problem with that. But it, you speak Chinese, you eat Chinese food, you everywhere in the world when the Taiwanese go to, go to a Chinese restaurant, they don't say, we go to Taiwanese restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so I'm, I'm confident that, that we are together. So I, I just, just said I don't want to see a war between Taiwan uh, uh, and the mainland. Uh, but then I see, say to my Taiwanese friend, don't always remind me of the, uh, your existence. If you ask a, a question, you know, with public opinion polls. So if you ask what is the most important problem you see in China, or uh, the people will say corruption, economic growth, uh, uh, many, many things, right? Uh, ethnic problems, uh, they don't mention Taiwan. If they raise 10, 10 questions, Usually they don't, they don't remember Taiwan. But if when Taiwan makes a trouble for us, and then you ask a question, or you put it around, you, you list 10, 10 items of the priorities, you list Taiwan there. And it, many people will, will mark Taiwan, of Taiwan, Taiwan, this is top priority. So this is a question I have. That is, it's really up to the Taiwanese to think about uh, what, what, what you, are, you are going to do, what their identity is. And I'm, I'm comfortable that Taiwan is, is part of the Chinese community. Uh, and culturally, ethnically, uh, food-wise, they're, they're Chinese. So why don't we have to worry about that? Uh, in the long run, when Taiwan is more prosperous, prosperous when Taiwan is, no, Beijing is more, uh, China, the mainland is more prosperous, richer, enjoying more freedom, enjoying more justice. We will we'll have a, more attractions to Taiwan. That is what we should do. You know, of course, we should also increase our military capabilities, but that is threatening. That is not necessarily uh, attraction to, to, to the Taiwanese. So we have provide attraction to Taiwan for them to say, well, we are part of this society. And finally, you can find a way to define the relationship between the two sides. People say in Chinese, uh, we don't have that kind of you know, uh, legal uh, consciousness to do those things. Uh, but we lived long enough for, for 70 years with this lack of clarity. We can live for another, for another 70 years or at least 40 years <laughs> for this ambiguity. If we don't fight war with each other, if we get along and we have economic integration, uh, social integration, well, that would be good. Come on. Briefly, I've got two concerns. Um, on the Chinese side, I'm not as sanguine as Professor Wang. Um, well, I agree that um, incentives are better than coercion. Uh, they're also plenty of voices in China that I think often get frustrated and impatient with the process that you laid out. Um, I don't know where Xi Jinping is on this. I, sort of, I think that there are indicators on both sides. Uh, every once in a while, a senior Chinese official will say, you know, we really can't achieve our centennial goals without full unification, which is sort of slightly ominous. On the Taiwan side, my frustration is Taiwan is simply not willing to make the hard domestic decisions to reform their economy to be competitive in the 21st century, to diversify their economy so they're not as vulnerable to dependence on the mainland, and most importantly, um, to make the investments in defense, right? I mean, I mean, the question I always used to ask my counterparts in Taiwan as I said, why aren't you doing what Israel did decades ago? Uh, because the threat is no um, less significant. But the Taiwan military is a classic case of underbalancing. 
Great. I am going to get a Georgetown student. So I know that Rolin Zhao <laughs> is a Georgetown student. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, I'm a student with Professor Wilder and Professor Manderos in the School of Foreign Service. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have two quick questions. First one for everyone on the panel, but particularly Professor Xuelan. I think that China is having a lot of domestic reform, especially in its innovation system, because it wants to be a leader in science and technology, and many in the direction that U.S. wants to see. Um, but what do you think that's making the Tijigaiga, the system reform process, so slow and difficult? What are the root causes and um, you think the essential reasons? And seconds for Professor Wang Jisu, you mentioned that in your five goals for world politics that it's necessary for the country to have a common belief system. But you also mentioned importance of, importance of freedom. Do you think those two are contradictory in a Chinese context? Thank you. Well, okay, uh, first of all, uh, I think thanks very much for your question. I think indeed, I think that uh, uh, China has actually over the last 40 years have made quite uh, uh, dramatic uh, you know, change in its uh, innovation system. Has, uh, we actually recently uh, published a book about uh, the 40 years reform and there were four major waves of reform. I think you're right. I think there were indeed some really sort of really uh, very challenging sort of issues, so-called the institutional issues that um, uh, still yet to be addressed. Uh, just one example, I think there's China has a system of so-called the pub, uh, public service units. I think very few people outside China realize that actually all the Chinese knowledge intensive institutions, including universities, all the schools, all the hospitals, all the research institutes are under this management system. So it's a very uh, you know, hierarchical administrative system. But for knowledge intensive institutions, this kind of management system is, is terrible. Right? So I think that uh, I, I went back to China in 1996, and I think actually in the 1990s, people were already talking about how can we actually reform the system. Now, more than 20 years have passed, but still, it's very difficult to, to change. Uh, just to one example is the salary system. You know, I think people would laugh. I think the salary system in the Shia Dan Wei. You know, I think now it's a few thousand RMBs a month, right? So, so I think there's a lot of, sort of ridiculous things in this kind of system. However, we want to make the change. Do you know how many people are involved? Take a guess. Take a guess. Millions. Uh -huh. No, more than that. Ten About mil 50 million people 50 are million. involved. Five zero. Five zero. About 50 million, probably more. And also, they're all wide spectrum, because I only mentioned some main ones, like for, for example, the kindergarten teachers, high school mm -hmm. teachers, and university professors. And also, some admin people in different organizations. So not just the amount, but also in terms of diversity of the people. So any change in this system, we're talking about 50 million people. And you're talking about the incentive system. Exactly. I mean, not just the incentive. Right. I mean, yeah, you know, incentives but, but and also their social securities and so on. If you look at the retired pe people in this system, I would say easily can go over 100 million people. So that's the kind of challenge that China is facing in any sort of change that I think actually I wanted to get in, you know, into the China's uh, you know, in the governance system. I think that China has gone through many waves of you know, governance system reform, but any change I think the scale and the complexity involved is just enormous. So I think that's sort of the, the issue. So I think we all are trying to push, but again, you know, somehow you, you can only make incremental change, you know, sometimes too, too slow. What was the exact question? Why don't you ask your question again, uh, uh -huh. Professor Jisa? You, get, you can take the microphone. There yeah, we go. I'm referring to the five goals that you mentioned that your new book in your new book. One of them is belief that it's necessary for a country to have one common belief system, and you also mentioned freedom that uh, individuals should be have have free be free to express what they want. Do you think that these two goals are contradictory because you can't have 
a common and also oh, I, individual. I, I, I don't want to Thanks. spend too much time promoting my book. Uh, <laughs> 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 when I say that, you know you have to have a, a, a belief system, I refer to uh, the lack of so for instance civility, uh, respect mm -hmm. to each other, and then at universities, there are people who still do uh, pl plagiarizing, right? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, plagiarism. Plagiarism. Yeah. plagiarism. That is not good. That is a question of, uh, of belief. And uh, so I, in, in, in one of my speeches uh, I gave to my school uh, graduates, I said, uh, what is a good, a, good, a good person? As a business person, you don't produce uh, fake go goods. As a student, you don't plagiarize. And as a, uh, you know, don't steal and, you know, that's very simple. But that is, to say in China, one, one of the things that troubles me is that it's, it's always money, money, money. If you can make money, whatever means mm -hmm. of making money is not important, as long as you can ach achieve something. So there are some, something which is should called universal value. Uh, that is, uh, you know, what is right in the United States is right in China. What is right in China should be right in the United States. That's very simple. But we don't, I don't really buy the, you know, the, 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 the argument that China has its own value system, the United States has its, its value system. As human beings, we follow the same, same principles. But in China, you know, there are ideological and political uh, differences between the, between the two societies. In China, we still very much accustomed to a hierarchical you know, system. We follow the leadership. We complain about the lack of government. But in the United States, you simply do what you want to do to improve the, the, the society. So we can learn from each other. I you know uh, um, the United States will not become a one-party country in the mm -hmm. next 40 years. Uh, I, uh, I hope not, uh, but China will also change. So th this is something that worries me the most, that is a, a, a value system is lacking in China. You say everything, you know, China is, is a rising power, we should pay uh, respect to this. And, and then the government says that is because, because of strong leadership, so we just follow the leadership. All that kind of value system is, it's not so, so much, per it's not perfect. Uh, we have to think about some other things, some other moral principles everybody should follow. Okay, so we, we only have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to do three questions. Um, boy, this is so difficult to decide <laughs> who, to, who to choose. Uh, why don't we do first yours, and then we'll take a couple more and then have the panel answer them. Thank you very much. I'm Ben Self from the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation. Yeah, good uh, to see you. We had Dennis out in Montana. We're trying to do an NGO-led cooperative project on energy and environment with the US, Japan, and China. And we're encountering all kinds of struggles because the clampdown on NGO activities within China, I guess based on the fear of color revolutions, there's been a real restriction on our ability to do what you've all said is necessary to stabilize the relationship. So my question is, and, and uh, in reference to the wonderful panel, all of you, really brilliant, thank you for inviting me. The um, suggestion that maybe President Trump doesn't represent the long-term true identity of the United States from uh, Wu Xinbo, thank you for that. Uh, we're wondering <laughs> whether Xi Jinping's closed and defensive attitude towards even foreign NGOs really represents the true character of China and when we might see a more opening attitude intellectually for this co kind of cooperation that we're trying to develop on important shared uh, goals. Thank you. I have to say, by the way, they make you ride horses out in Montana <laughs> when you go with them. Okay, a couple more. Um, maybe this gentleman right there. Yeah. Hey, Huang Haitao, Nankai University, China, and I'm now the Fulbright Scholar at Georgetown. And uh, this is a quite wonderful panel, and uh, such kind of dialogue is, was quite rare uh, in DC for the past uh, couple of uh, months. 
uh, because uh, just now Ivan had talked about uh, we should now to demoralizing each other. But actually, uh, stigmatization is kind of fashion in DC. And the people got a kind of a series of rhetoric when they are talking about China, such as the enforced transfer of technology and, and blah, blah. And uh, uh, so I just wonder, my question is, do you think that there is, uh, because in China we are talking about the consensus in DC towards China. Do you think there's a really a consensus now in, from your perspective? Thank you. In DC you're talking about? Or to, on China, okay. Yeah. And from the law school over here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I uh, had a question basically about the rule of law, but I just wanted to preface it with uh, taking some issue with Dennis's characterization of the, the last 40 years, and I know it's not your own, but the comment Please. you made at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you know, I first went to China in 1979, and when I was leaving in 1980, uh, all my Chinese classmates tearfully said goodbye to me, well, you know, we'll never see you again because Reagan had been elected president of the United States <laughs> and had promised to de-recognize de the PRC. Uh, and then we're two months away from the, the 30th anniversary of Tiananmen, which was certainly a much worse period and the ensuing couple of years were than uh, anything that's happening right now. So we need some perspective about that. Absolutely. Uh, but my, my, my uh, comment is really about the rule of law. This is one area where I think uh, almost every legal scholar in the West who studies China believes that there's been serious backsliding here. The rule of law is worse off in China today than it has been for 15 years or so. Uh, and uh, I think it's mostly attributable to uh, the regime of uh, Xi Jinping, uh, who has decided to use the law for political purposes and political persecutions, uh, but also with the uh, internment of people in Xinjiang uh, and other factors. It, it makes people despair that the rule of law has seriously taken root in China, despite advances that we thought were made for the first 25 or 30 years. Okay, so we have the question about NGOs, rule let, of law, let me, yeah, let me take the and the Washington consensus. Yeah, yeah. Let me take uh, the, <coughs> the question about NGOs. I, I think that, uh, as we've, we've already heard, that the, the government's concern about color revolution is real. I mean, there, there are indeed, I think, uh, many stories about how NGOs played roles in, in the, you know, the, the uh, color, color revolution in, uh, in other countries. Um, so I think the, the most, I think that, I think you're referring to the most recent uh, law on international NGOs. I, you know, I think actually we have a research institute within the public policy school that studies NGO. And I've had some discussion with them about this. And I think they say they actually they are, uh, in a way they, what they see this as an, a progress in terms of supporting NGOs. Because in the past, there was no law on international NGOs. So in a way, the international NGOs previously was operating in a gray zone. So I think that's actually, in a way, you, 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 you because I think in terms of institutional, I think in, in a previous, before this law, you know, in terms of the, you know, uh, the, the kind of structure, I mean, you know, foreign multinationals, whatever, there are, you know, laws supporting the, the you know, the, their operation, but in terms of NGOs, there was not. So some NGOs registered as, you know, a business. Others actually do not do that. So I think they're operating in a gray zone, actually, that's probably not necessarily the best way. So I think what this law actually allows is that actually you do have a, you know, a system, how do you sort of register within the relevant government agency. For example, I know the the U.S. Uh, 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 um, NGO uh, EDF, Environmental Defense Fund, and they are registered as an uh, you know international NGOs. So I think that maybe the process is cumbersome, you know. I, but I think that you know I think given the you know your energy and the environmental area, you you can go through the process. Once you go through that, and I certainly you can operate the way you want. So I, I don't know whether you've gone through that process. Yeah, we, we have. Okay. It, it's more the broader. Mm -hmm. than it is the law okay. or the atmosphere. Okay. Rule of law? No. No. Can we talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> I will pick the easier one, uh, the consensus. Oh, but, please. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm a, not a legal scholar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wrote uh, some pieces on rule of law mm -hmm. uh, as compared to rule by law. Mm -hmm. What we have in China is something like rule by law because right. you, you rule the, the society by the law you, you create yourself, right? So you, you, you base your, your rule on, on the laws you create. So this is not rule of law. So I spent a lot of time explaining to the student I have uh, what is rule of law. So I, I use some examples like your presidential elections. Uh, you, you have a new president uh, who, who was not popularly e elected, but you had to, to accept him as a, as a, as a legitimate leader. Uh, but you just because you have the rule of law. Uh, so I don't really want to go further to comment on China. Uh, I take your, your comment seriously and take your comments and questions as comments. I don't challenge your comments. Okay. Um, I think there is a consensus uh, here in Washington uh, that the US um, needs to be <laughs> tougher on China, uh, to be better prepared to uh, compete with China and also to try to um, change China's behaviors and policies uh, in economic trade and other areas. So that is kind of you know, a bipartisan consensus. However, um, when people talk about competition, why is that competition but also uh, uh, cooperation as necessary? So it's a you know, combination of competition and cooperation. Others, when they talk about strategic competition, they're actually uh, uh, promoting a more uh, uh, confrontational approach towards China. And still others, when they talk about competition, they are thinking about a Cold War style uh, relationship with China. So if you think about the long-term uh, trajectory of US policy towards China, I don't think the consensus is already there, especially when it comes to what kind of price the US is willing to pay, what kind of cost they can afford uh, in dealing with China. I mean, just like you know, some people advocate decoupling of economies. Some think this is impossible. Some believe the US can be tougher on China in economic trade. Some people think, well, maybe tariff is not the right way uh, to do that. So I think this is kind of, this is not an either or situation. And I think it's still evolving. And the trend of US-China policy is not only subject to the um, dynamic internal debate here in the United States, but also uh, are subject to reaction from China. If China responded in a more constructive way, and we can help shape a more stable and uh, 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 constructive relationship. If China responded in a more negative way, more alarmist, destructive way, then you know this relationship can become uh, much worse than it is today, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. So let me okay, come yeah. in on this yeah. point on yeah. consensus. Mm -hmm. So of course, with the stipulation, America is a big complicated place, so consensus, small c. Mm -hmm. But I would say there's a consensus on the following points. Number one, that the idea of convergence in the relationship is dead. And by convergence, I don't mean political convergence. I'm not of the view that US policy has been predicated upon the democratization of China. But I do think that there was a belief that China would um, accelerate its embrace of market-oriented reforms and would become a greater supporter of the key attributes of the international system. So convergence is dead. Number two, that engagement strategies really aren't effective. So there's largely an abandonment of a strategy that's exclusively engagement. Now, I believe engaging 
China will always be part of a strategy, it just won't be the leading dimension of a strategy, and we're going to see much more competitive dimensions come to the fore. We've seen that. Number three, to make an obvious point, competition more than cooperation will define the relationship. And four, we should simply be ready for an environment of persistent and consistent friction in the relationship. I would say there's largely convergence on those points, but where that will take the U.S.-China relationship, it's hard to tell. And I, I just want to make one quick point on the insight that Jim shared with us about the U.S.-China relationship. I agree that the last 40 years has demonstrated a striking resilience in the U.S.-China relationship, whether it's the election of uh, Reagan, Tiananmen, Belgrade, EP3, Chung Guang Chung, right? This is a relationship that bounces back. Here's my concern about the next 40 years. When I look at Chinese ambitions, uh, especially Xi Jinping's ambitions, Chinese capabilities, China's belief that it needs us less now than ever before, and Chinese frustrations and grievances, I see them at sort of those factors as different. And I worry that that fundamentally undercuts the resilience that we experienced in the past. I mean, you know the refrain, we were poor back then and had to accept it. We're not poor anymore, and we will not accept it. And this, this notion, for example, that the United States was behind the color revolutions, right? That we were the ones that brought about all the instability in the Middle East because somehow that's what Facebook was all about, right? That's, that's just sort of a small example of, I think, some of these frustrations and grievances. So, of course, I hope the resilience is there, but there are some big factors in, in uh, sort of the China variable that may um, undercut that. Trilan, you're going to get the last word. Well, I, I think I just wanted to, I think, referring to that sort of consensus, I, of course, I think uh, Evan says probably has some more uh, you know, authority on the, the consensus in Washington, D.C., but I just wanted to say that in the, in the U.S., and there are indeed different voices, and the, uh, the most recent report that by Susan Shirk and, he, and her colleagues, uh, so-called overreach and overreaction, that's actually presented a different kind of a picture. And, and so I think maybe that's something that you could read. Yeah. Well, I want to thank our panel. Uh, of course, we have to grade them because we are a university. I think you'll agree with me that they all get an A-plus for this uh, event this morning. Thank you so much for coming from so far to be with us today. Uh, terrific thank you very much. insights. And uh, certainly the complexity of the U.S.-China relationship has been eloquently brought out this morning. So thank you. Thank you.